Welcome to A State of Mind. This is Julian Royce. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's good to be back here. As some of you have noted, it's been a while since the last episode, and the pace of episodes has slowed down of late. This is partly because I've moved to this beautiful new office here, I've moved to a new house, I did some traveling, I've been spending a lot of time building my own therapy practice and working hard with that. So a lot of good things going on here. And I've also, and this may be surprising to some of you, <laughs> accepted a job part-time teaching at Naropa University this semester. And so, yeah, and that's actually feeling really good. Some of you may be surprised by that, but I do love and appreciate Naropa University and any criticism I've directed there has really been with the intention to have it move in a good direction, not to try to destroy it or tear it down. Um, I think I've said that repeatedly, but in our world today with social media, with sound clips, with people forming quick, fast opinions about things, there can be a tendency to want to destroy things or tear things down or totally recreate something. And sometimes there's a lot of good somewhere and it's just a matter of helping it move in an even better direction rather than trying to paint it as all good or all bad. That's, that's not my intention at all. And I hope that anyone who actually listens to this podcast can, can realize that, that we, we live in this complex world of a lot of nuance, of a lot of complexity, and black and white thinking is basically the opposite of what I believe in and what I'm trying to do here. So I have received a lot of messages and feedback from some recent episodes, uh, especially some controversy about the episode uh, concerning Europa University. I will be sharing that feedback and messages and addressing that more directly in the introduction to the next episode. So please look out for that. Hopefully that will come out soon. As always, feel free to send me a message through our website, thestateofmindpodcast.com. And we have gotten to be at several events recently, including uh, the Emergence Festival that I shared and recently an event called Decriminalized Nature. It was a fundraising event, had a lot of great artists and musicians, and the State of Mind podcast had a booth there. So thank you for everyone who came by there, showed your support. If you are interested in getting your own sticker with our logo, t-shirt, or a hoodie, like the one I'm wearing now, please send us a message through our website. We don't have it set up to order them directly, but you can get them in different sizes and colors. So let us know what you want and we can hook you up. So today I am speaking with fellow psychedelic assisted therapist, Jen Pfizer. And this is Jen's second time on the podcast and it's a real honor to have her back on to hear her wisdom. Jen served as the supervisor and clinical director of Innate Path and she was instrumental in developing the model of psychedelic psychotherapy used there. And she's one of my teachers. I took the training with Innate Path. I appreciate it a lot. I'm happy to recommend it to anyone who wants a professional training in this field. And part of her interests are in making psychedelic, psychedelically informed care as accessible to as many people as possible. And that was a large part of her motivation in returning to the podcast. She wanted to share ways and techniques that you can use somatic-based uh, processes to start to heal your own trauma on your own, especially through using in a conscious, mindful way cannabis sativa. And so we talk about that in this episode. And it may be surprising for some of you to think about cannabis in this way, but it can be used in a really medicinal and healing way. Set and setting, intention, and all these things matter a lot. And we talk about it. And part of my work here as a therapist has been at times to help people to come to a healthier, happier relationship with that. And um, that's something else that we talked about in this episode. So there's a lot of good information in this episode. I hope you enjoy it. As always, without further ado, I bring you Jen Pfizer. today with Jen Pfizer. Jen, thanks for being back on the podcast. My pleasure. <laughs> and so do you want to do you want to briefly just introduce yourself for folks who didn't see see you the first time around? Sure. So yeah, we did a podcast a little while ago and it ended up we were just kind of just talking and um, it ended up being quite a bit about cannabis, which I think surprised both of us. And um, so we're doing this again um, to go further into that. And I just want to like give a little bit of my background as to um, where I'm coming from. I'm a therapist, a psychotherapist, and, uh, and I used to run a clinic that 
specialized in uh, PTSD, trauma-related symptoms and diagnoses using psychedelics and somatically um, kind of parts-based um, work. That Our model was somatic and parts Parts based for the most part. And then um, we ended up closing after three years, mostly due to COVID, because our our um, our work is so hands-on and we just kind of hmm. lost, you know, we lost a lot of ground. And um, and then so we reformed ourselves into more of a training company because we had amassed quite a bit of experience and our knowledge base had grown so much so we started doing trainings for therapists or any anybody that's working in the in the psychedelic field mm. so we get a lot of different people at our trainings nurses doctors therapists um even uh body workers <laughs> and even people mm -hmm. that are there that are more like um off to the side, like people that work with the music and things okay. like that. So yeah. it, it's been great. It's been a really nice combination of people. So we do a training for psychedelic therapy. And um, one of the things that we use in the training experientially is cannabis. We use ketamine as well. And those are the two substances that we were, that people were using when they came and did work at the clinic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those are the two legal options right now for psychedelic assisted therapy, right? So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they work that's great. <laughs> and they're wonderful legal options. Well, yeah. That's yeah. great to have you back on and dive deeper into this. And there's so much excitement around psychedelic therapy. And it feels mm -hmm. like there's all these people, players, organizations kind of jockeying near the, like, I almost imagine like a race, like they're like getting near the starting line and like waiting for more options to become legalized, which seems likely to happen in the next year or two or three. And mm -hmm. it seems like Colorado is really positioning itself to be at the forefront of all this. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we and especially for those of us who have because it if you have the right type of therapy, any any psychedelic or what we refer to as an expressive medicine is going to work because mm -hmm. we're really talking about accessing ourselves in a certain way. Yeah. Um I like that phrase expressive medicine. That's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I I have like a well, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but just a way of explaining that that help that can help people kind of understand what that means. But yeah, but um, yeah. So many uh, there's a good group of us here in Colorado that have been working in the field for a while. So um, getting some experience, and yeah. I love to see all the people opening up clinics because <laughs> we uh, yeah. were like the first one, and it was yeah. and it was very stressful was it yeah it was very stressful Whoa, and it was... wasn't necessarily my my favorite thing to mm. run a clinic um but we did it because we knew that we had a modality that that would work with these other medicines mm. and um and we wanted to help bring it to the world you know yeah especially with cannabis because cannabis as we'll talk about today um cannabis is something that people don't think of as a therapeutic support. I mean, we see it as medicinal, and we see it medicinally um, even as like helping in the, in the realm of mental health um, as something that might help with anxiety, help with PTSD, right. as a management strategy, but we don't often talk about it. We weren't talking about it pretty much at all at this time. Um, as an actual therapeutic aid in the therapy session. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's exciting for me, and I think it's true, and mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of people who are surprised by that idea. Mm -hmm. They've never heard of it or considered it that way, and, um, but I also want to appreciate that you were, you know, doing psychotherapy, trauma-informed therapy, somatic work, kind of, you know, when you say parts work, you're talking about, like, parts of yourself, right? Like, kind of, yeah, it's kind yeah. of a jargony thing term yeah. so i apologize but, for so that but doing, yeah you were doing this great work therapeutically before getting into the psychological yes. therapy and i think that i think that matters i think that's important because it's like let's find therapy that's really good that really works that really helps people on a deep level and then we can bring in these extra tools these medicines but we're not like relying on them and you're not like building your whole foundation based on them if that makes sense i think that 
It's a good I, distinction, I agree actually. With you. Yeah. I actually agree with you because when you when you jump into psychedelics without a modality that supports them, um, you can only get so far. One um, and and you misunderstand something really important that's coming mm. out in the world, which is that you know it is a it is about us. We are the medicine. Mm. Um, it we are psychedelic Mm. um and what we're doing when we're using these expressive medicines is we're getting access to that and learning to not only understand it build knowledge for ourselves with it but also learn to trust it and um coming back we've gone so far away from trusting ourselves Mm, yeah. in this world yeah. that um that is really the medicine we need we need to yeah. heal and we need to see how that works and we need to have that experience and we need to you know come out from underneath a lot of the fear and trauma that's plaguing us as a world but we also need to establish that we are the authority of ourselves mm. yeah and, i love that and that's such a huge part of the healing process like i've seen this mm-hmm. in myself and the people i work with yeah. and learning how to trust yourself and, and claiming back the power that's actually already there. Mm-hmm. It's like the word psychedelic in my understanding literally means mind manifesting. Mm-hmm. And our mind is already manifesting itself all the time. Like that's whatever right. we experience is our own mind creation in some sense in important ways. Right. Right. And, so, right. Yeah. and we talk about, um, we talk about manifesting. <laughs> that's a, that's a term that's yeah, like used in a lot of yeah. places and you can manifest your reality, you know, your creator being and things like that. Yeah. And, um, but, but how do we actually access that? We have to get back to the um, having trust in ourselves and mm. having authority over ourselves. And, and that takes <clears throat> resolving all of the powerlessness that's actually heaped on top of us. We, we're, yeah. we actually have just a natural power. We have a natural um, uh, ability to manage our worlds and that's been covered up yeah not we don't have to we don't have to create power Mm. um we have to we have to release the powerlessness and the Mm. power's just there we are naturally incredibly powerful um beings and that word power has even become uh which we might have talked about in the last (laughs) thing but that word power has become like a pejorative like you know power means power over others or something like that and and that's not real power real power which we have in abundance is like uh a lion laying in the sun Mm. beautiful yeah yeah i guess it's a rabbit hole we don't have to go too far down but just when you uh-huh. said like you know you or i manifest a reality it's like part of my mind like picks up and it's like well it's i think where people go wrong is the i that's the they think like there's this little ego that's manifesting the world and that's not what the buddhist teachings are talking about when they talk about consciousness manifesting our reality it's like yeah the interconnected play of everything that's manifesting in our mind but there's not this separate little ego that's somehow creating it all and so that's where the some of the new age law of attraction stuff Mm-hmm. goes to weird places that end up causing very harm. Yeah. very weird places <laughs> but i mean it's weird to us that we would have connection to like a, a multi-dimensional you know cosmic reality where things are manifested we don't actually see ourselves as um belonging to that mm. um yeah. you know that's that's a whole conversation around ego and it's really interesting some of the polarities in our culture right now where um we have on one hand and i think we might have actually talked about this in the last podcast but we have on one hand this this sort of um desire i mean especially in the psychedelic realm but also in others Mm -hmm. but like this like the life hacking realm or something like Mm -hmm. that we have this desire to overcome our ego transcend our ego or to to kill our ego and um and at the same time we're doing this thing that over identifies with ego at the exact same time Mm -hmm. so it's like i want to transcend my ego but i want to be better i want to be um (laughs) (laughs) i want to i want to 
be, uh, I want to be a more perfect person. I want to be better than others. You know, I want to protect myself because the ego, as I think, as we experience it mostly is basically just a culmination of our defense strategies. Mm. Yeah. I mean, like on trying, a net, trying to control. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause like, you know, the Buddhists say that we, that ego doesn't even exist. Yeah. Um, and we wouldn't perceive it as such if it wasn't, if we weren't actually using our conscious mind to create identity and yeah, a yeah. defense structure. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big topic, yeah. It's a huge topic. Maybe we could look at it like Sorry. another perspective on it is that as part of our development, we we create the ego, we create the sense of self and it serves functions, but it's not ultimately true or yeah like we're actually bigger than that if that makes sense so we're way bigger than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like the ego the sense of ego is basically how do you function in the conscious waking world mm. that's it it's just you know what uh, we have to filter out the bigger part of who we are to manage the material reality mm -hmm. yeah and that's great <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. we wa I we're humans for a reason. It's like we want to be humans. And so in a, in a <clears> sense, <throat> an ego is something you want to um, appreciate. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, and so, um, well, I guess on this line, like psychedelics are can kind of blast that open, give people an experience of themselves or the world or whatever beyond their ego. And that's awesome. And I think good therapy should really be helping us all to do that. Like whether there's psychedelic medicine involved or not, mm -hmm. Yeah. you know, cause the quest to like perfect the ego is doomed to failure, right? Like you're saying, so we <laughs> have something bigger to tap into. Yeah. And I think once we realize, and I think the psychedelic um, work is a process of realizing that we are so much more mm. than our waking consciousness conceives of. Um, and, and when we become, when we, when we start identifying with that, hmm. instead of identifying with the conscious rational mind, then we realize that one, it's brilliant. I, we are brilliant. Hmm. It's, we are trustable. It's always trustable. Even if it seems to be hurting us, it's doing it to protect us. Hmm. And, um, in a usually very ingenious ways. And, um, and we learn that uh, we don't, we ha always do have control. Mm. So, you know, like when people come in and they're at first, when they come in to do psychedelic therapy, usually one of the things that they're afraid of is this idea of a loss of control. Yeah. And you just kind of hinted to that when you said mm. blast through the ego. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's what we think is going to happen. We're going to blast through our ego and we're mm. not going to have control and it's going to get scary and we're going to like be free falling through the universe or whatever. Mm. Um, and it's kind of like metaphors like that. I think you're like adding to that kind of mythology that we're, that we're blasting through, um, we are, we are in a sense blasting through our defense structure and not blasting, but just kind of, I mean, when you're using cannabis and ketamine, especially and not high doses, you're not blasting anything. You're just kind of taking that filter mm. and setting it aside yeah. for a moment. So you have an experience of yourself on a larger, okay. in a larger way. And, um, and, but what we find out is that we've been in control the whole time and we are always in control. And that's where the <laughs> real manifesting emerges. Yeah. In well, so that. Maybe, yeah. Maybe instead of saying blasting through, it could be like transcend and include, like you get a bigger perspective, but those structures can still be there if you need them, something like that. Or, or not even mentioning it, just kind of going, you know, we're getting in touch with our larger self. Mm. We're yeah. getting in touch with a larger intelligence within ourselves. Beautiful. Yeah. And so to bring it back around to cannabis like that, mm -hmm. it's surprising to people that it can be used therapeutically and also surprising to some people that it's a real psychedelic. It can have like psychedelic effects and it can be really safe and... Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that you use it in the training that you do and you use it with clients. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's fun to like watch how people are shocked by it because most people have an experience with cannabis. This is, this is where the conversation gets into cannabis, like yeah. how, um, how neat it is. Um, 
a lot of people have an experience with cannabis um, recreationally or socially, sometimes just with themselves, but they're, but they're using it in their mind recreationally. And, you know, kind of what that amounts to is um, using it in a way that favors an, an external locus of focus. Hmm. I just made that. Like, like, something, just, like a social situation? Or, yeah. 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 So when we're doing anything recreational, we're, um, we're maybe interacting with other people. You know, so our focus is outside of ourselves. We're watching TV. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in nature. We're observing nature. Even that is a focus outside of ourselves. Mm. So, um, so when our focus is outside of ourselves, we're having one type of experience with it. Um, and then, you know, if you, I know some groups are using cannabis ceremonially. When you, when you're using. Um, anything a psychedelic ceremonially your focus is on connecting to uh you know like connecting to source or connecting to spirit hmm. you're like um spending time in kind of like the spiritual realm and and getting in touch with often something kind of external like a like a ritual yeah a group interesting yeah you know i mean that's not always the case like with many like ayahuasca or something, you're you're going internally, but you're but you're experiencing yourself from a spiritual perspective. Your spiritual the aspect of yourself mm -hmm. spiritually, right? Which you know is news to a lot of people, and that's why you know we see so many people um, pursuing these experiences. Yeah, definitely becoming more popular, and I think it's good. But so part of what I'm hearing you say is that. Therapy is providing a different experience, a different avenue that's yes. actually distinct from a purely, so to speak, more spiritual approach or a recreational approach. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so therapy is where you're turning toward yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you're just uh, looking inward instead of looking externally. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at yourself through a human lens. You know, you're, you're addressing the human experience of you know relationship and neurosis and fears mm. and yeah. you know desires and things like that so um so when that happens someone that's only used cannabis recreationally when they turn toward themselves in a therapeutic container they often have uh, a very different experience you know, it's kind of yeah. like... It's like she can be shocking. Yeah. 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 They're like... <laughs> it, and it's usually a really big experience, and it often doesn't take very much medicine at all. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's amazing how rare it is to... For someone to have an experience with cannabis where you're really just present with your experience moment to moment and not... Yeah, you know, like you said, not engaged socially, not, you know, mm -hmm. noticing the effects it has. Um, the other thing that... I appreciate about the innate path training and what you're doing is the combination psychedelic assisted therapy. And so you're staying in connection, you're doing therapeutic work, people can talk, mm -hmm. which is um, again, different than a ceremonial context where everyone's kind of in their own space and there's not that therapeutic process. And it's also different than like what seems to be becoming more and more common are these like ketamine clinics where people will take get infusions, they'll have an injection of ketamine and you're left alone in a room for an hour and a half or two hours. Mm -hmm. But there's not the therapeutic component of working with a therapist who actually knows you and is actually connecting with you in the moment, in that experience. So I'm a big advocate for this, like, ther you know, psychedelic assisted therapy mm -hmm. and bringing it all together and having a longer relationship over a longer period of time, not just like a one-off experience, not just being left alone in a room, not just trying to figure it out on yourself. You know, that's what I'm Mm -hmm. And not just having an yeah. experience by yourself and then integrating it afterwards. Yeah, that's the difference too. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it is quite a big difference um, because you imagine that you're, you're going into realms that aren't your conscious mind. So you're going into these subconscious realms and having an experience. Often, if your conscious mind is kind of set aside for the time being, one, you don't even, like, have a very good memory of it. Right, yeah. 
Um, and so trying to integrate it afterwards is, can be, uh, it can often feel futile. Oh, it can be, and it can be hard to trust the memory, trust the experience. Mm -hmm. You're using the word trust earlier, you know, mm -hmm. almost like you hopped on a rocket ship and you went to a different planet or dimension, so to speak, you know, not literally, but then you okay. come back and you're like, then you're back to your normal life. And you're like, well, that was a, that's an interesting memory, like a dream I had or something. Right. right. But it hasn't, you know, the rubber hasn't met the road in terms of mm -hmm. your own process. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. and think, you may not, and a lot of people don't know what to do with it. Like, what was that supposed to mean? Yeah. And for so they look for someone to help them integrate it, and it's almost like going to a therapist and and getting, you know, dream therapy or something. Yeah. Using yeah. talk therapy to analyze dreams. It's very similar to that. Yeah. And the payoff is pretty small. Hmm. Interesting. However, you can do it another way. Um, you can... You can be with a therapist, and, and, and I mean, we're talking about therapy right now, but the point of us talking today was kind of, what can we do on our own? What can we do yeah. at home? What can we do yeah. with our friends um, to create something that's healing or um, beneficial mm -hmm. in a way that affects us, you know, beneficially? Yeah. Um, but so if you're there with a therapist, and I, and I believe everybody deserves uh some kind of time spent where they are held by another person mm. that they can trust mm -hmm. in a way that allows them to really go deep into what they're holding it's such a beautiful experience and and we can go deeper into ourselves when someone else is there um because we're not alone mm. and um you know the subconscious is it's it's brilliant, and it doesn't actually even allow us to go into scary places um, alone often. And the reason that it doesn't is because often those scary places are there from childhood. and the whole and the whole um, problem that happened at the time and the reason they got kind of exiled into the shadow hmm. is that, um, there was a failure of re of relationship mm -hmm. to protect. Mm. So um, if there isn't a safe relationship involved, those places won't bubble to the surface to be felt. Yeah, We're still protected from them until we actually find the safe place that they can come up in. Mm. I, I hope I'm not being too yeah. complicated with that. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, so part of the point of our conversation today is to give some guidance for people who want to use something like cannabis on their own in a more meaningful way to find that, because you can kind of learn these therapy skills and then start to apply them on your own. You don't mm -hmm. have to. Yeah. And I think that should, should be another goal for good therapy, that you're actually learning skills and tools that you can then apply on your own. Um, so, yeah, so what would... Well, I mean, with the people that are, are my clients, my goal is that they feel like their own therapist at the end and they can mm. explore it in any way they want to afterwards, alone, with their partner, with friends, yeah. you know. That's um, beautiful. They know the route. They've, they've experienced and gone the path through themselves and now they know it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a self-knowledge. So it's kind of like... In a lot of esoteric teachings, they talk about knowledge that isn't hidden, but it is self-secret. Yeah, yeah. Meaning that we have to find it ourselves. Mm. And that's, and totally, this is one of those paths to find all those self-secret places and find it for ourselves. And then we're the knowers. Yeah, that's fascinating. It reminds me, I had a meditation teacher who told the retreat, he's like, you have to become your own meditation teacher. You know, you have to become your own. Exactly. Kind of know what you need and be able to know these tools and be able to use them. And so, yeah. That, yeah. And that's, that's becoming the authority of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, so for someone listening to this who wants to try out cannabis in this way, like, what would you recommend? Because it's, yeah, it's legal. It's, it's pretty safe. It's something that people have access to here in Colorado, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, 
one of the things that, well, we talked, let me see how, how best to enter into this. First of all, um, even if you try working with cannabis and you have uncomfortable experiences, um, they're not dangerous. Now we can, there are things like just something to know about oneself. If you're holding a lot of trauma that you probably want to make sure you have good resources and support, um, anyway, just anyway, yeah. but, um, but if you're going to start a journey of self exploration through cannabis or any other psychedelic, um, know yourself. So, um, one, uh, take a good look at your life before, um, you don't have to do this before you can figure it out as you go along. Um, but the thing to keep in mind, like I was bringing up earlier was that a lot of what we're holding, a lot of what causes symptoms in adulthood, anxiety, depression, let's say mm. anything, um, is seated in childhood. Mm. So uh, we live in a culture that that doesn't have good bonds to our children. We don't have good bonds to the community. And therefore, often uh, children have experiences of being overwhelmed in childhood and afraid. Yeah. It's not the same as an adult fear. An adult fear, you usually, you know, um, you usually don't become afraid because you are able to manage your, navigate your environment and you have a lot of power. You become afraid as an adult if you have a bunch of stuff in childhood that was overwhelming. Hmm. So when, so yeah. something to keep in mind is take a good hard look at your childhood. Um, you know, what, what was it like? Did you have a lot of fears as a kid? Did you have traumas as a child? Did you have, did you have adults that you could trust that you could go to for things? Did you ever feel alone? Were there ever times when, you know, uh, you went through periods of overwhelm? And often, uh, often these periods will happen when you're little, real little, um, depending, but they can also surprisingly people are often surprised how much we're impacted by our adolescence hmm. so as adolescents yeah, we are entering into as children we're bonding to our caretakers which sets up the the um sets up the template for our intimate relationships later on in life hmm. And we bond to ourselves, you know, but in adolescence, we bond to our community. Mm. And if that bond doesn't take, you know, like if something goes wrong at that time, um, it's also a bond to the self sexually. So like if that goes, if something doesn't go well with that, then often we'll have a lot of that coming up in our lives, causing a lot of problems. So um, it's important to just kind of map that out because when... We go into the, our, we open ourselves up to our subconscious terrain and we're no longer managing it with our conscious mind. Mm -hmm. um, the, what comes up are those things. Mm. That's what emerges immediately. So a lot of people, this, this is really interesting, a lot of people have a, have a negative experience with cannabis. They, they um, use cannabis and they immediately get anxious, especially if they're around mm. other people in a community. And what's happening there is not bad. And it, doesn't, and it doesn't mean you're bad or you have any problems. What it means is memory from some sort of community wound is just surfacing to be felt and to be healed. Yeah, that's a great point. That's well said. Yeah. yeah. So know that. Know that. So, yeah, part of what you're saying is if you have cannabis and you feel anxious or socially anxious or awkward or whatever, it's not necessarily coming from the substance itself but it's actually revealing mm -hmm. some trauma and some stuff from and it's a chance for you to work through it exactly it's yeah. it's it is the process of self-healing that is how our self our innate healing system hmm. works um as soon as you're safe enough and and it seems kind of contrary but cannabis actually makes us feel safe enough 
yeah. which is why it pops up. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the, and it, and it's an autonomic healing system, meaning that just like if you cut yourself, it heals. Mm -hmm. We have a natural way of healing um, our our wounds that come from um, some sort of bonding scenario that, that didn't work out. I mean, we need those bonds. We need them. So, like, mm. we need to heal them. It's it's a really big, important deal. So, yeah. um, so they come up uh, immediately to be felt. And you, everybody's heard this in therapy, to feel it, you to heal it, feel it. Right. Um, and that's literally all you have to do is allow yourself to feel it hmm. and let the fear move through. You know, it's all nice. embodied. So it's like you can just allow it to do what it's going to do. Sometimes we'll hmm. get shaky. Sometimes we'll get cold. Sometimes hmm. we want to curl up in a ball. Um, sometimes our hands curl into fists or our faces will scowl. That's just memory emerging hmm. to be felt. Mm -hmm. And if we allow it, it will pass mm. and we will um, discharge it. So like that feeling of, I need to let this go. I need to let this go. Yeah, you do. But the only way to let it go is to allow it to emerge and it will release itself. In trying to let something go, we often, you know, we fail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, we don't know it's how to subtle, do that. Right? Yeah. So because you're trying to let it go. You're kind of pushing it away or forcing, trying to yeah. move it away instead of embracing it, instead of feeling it. Totally. It's like sitting there going, I got to heal this cut. I got to heal this cut. I got to heal. <laughs> you know, it's not, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. But you are healing it. Hmm. And that's the you that we can come to trust. Yeah. It makes me, it makes me think about, I appreciate what you said about community and the bonds and how those need to be healed and how I think many of us are going through life fairly successful, independent. Like we have such an individualistic culture. And there can be a sense of, maybe there's a sense of, like, there's something wrong, there's something off, but I'm okay, I can handle it, I'm doing okay. And actually, that's different from doing this healing process and coming to a place where you're connected with other people in community, you actually trust the community, you trust yourself, you trust other people. Not like a blind, naive kind of trust, but a sense of feeling and knowing connection and being nourished by that connection versus feeling like you have to do everything on your own or you're kind of independent, cut off. I mean, I think it's a little, it can be subtle, but it's actually really deep and powerful. It feels yeah. subtle, but it's, it's like the magnitude is, is Mag huge. Yeah. It's a huge thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's going to be hard. Our finding our way back to that is going to be hard. We have to be very patient with ourselves and we have to yeah. be very patient with others and willing to get, you know, to get back on the horse and try again. But yeah. But once you're bonded, I mean, if you think about this, uh, a, a bonded child never doubts their parents' protection. Mm. And a bonded adult or an adolescent coming into the community, uh, if, they are, if they bond, they don't doubt that the community has their back. Mm. So it's the bond that's like a magnet. Would another way of saying that be so securely attached, like secure attachment? It is, but yeah. I think the word secure attachment kind of makes it like, meh, I have insecure attachment, no big deal. Huh. Or I have secure attachment, so I feel better than other than I would in relationship, right? But 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 like bonded is kind of like this cosmic interplay of, you know, when you're truly bonded to someone, it's incredibly hard to separate. Hmm. And we're meant to be bonded. Yeah, that, we're meant yeah. to be bonded to our parents, to our, you know, our spouses, to our community, to our children, to right. ourselves. I think that's um, something I'm really realizing is what you just said. We're, we're meant to be bonded. We're meant to be connected. We're meant, you know, our nervous systems exist in a relationship with others, with the environment. We're constantly influencing and affecting each other. And we're incredibly social creatures. You know, we don't exist isolated we don't exist independently and so right and if you have that yeah. bond in the community it's like a glue that holds everything together very powerfully yeah. and and if you have that then um you don't have to you don't have to do that thing that 
we find ourselves doing in, in our times right now, which is forming intentional communities. Mm. Forming intentional communities means you're taking that conscious mind and applying it to the yeah. problem of an unbonded community. Mm -hmm. But but you're, a, you're trying to create a bond from the top down. Mm. What we need is to heal, the sh do the shadow work, the mm. stuff that we reject or project. We need to heal it. And then the bond starts to be uncovered, just like our power. It's, it's our nature to be bonded. Mm, I love that. So as yeah. we uncover that stuff, we bond, and then we don't have to make it happen. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. I appreciate that so much. So yeah, rather than having to make the connections or go out and make friends or build a community, it's like... Let's do this like deeper work and uncover that we're already connected. We're already influencing each other. We're already here together and we're yeah. already depending on each other. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an honest, honest mistake. I mean, we're yeah. all making it yeah. yeah. and it's like, it's not our fault that we're making it. <laughs> and, um, it's very disheartening when we make it, how many of our communities fall apart. I mean, I hear that from oh, a lot yeah. of people yeah. in the training, they've been intentionally trying to create community and, and then it blows up. And, you know, they feel like they failed and, you know, and we get really hard on ourselves and we feel like, mm. you know, something's wrong with us. Nothing's wrong with us. We're just, we're just, um, we're, we're just not bonded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's a tremendous amount of value in having a good map, so to speak. And I mm -hmm. hope this conversation is helping people develop a good map for themselves because what you're sharing is really powerful and, and you can then you can have some confidence in that and follow it and then you can feel the benefits from it and um yeah it's just there's definitely a lot here that we can uncover these bonds that we have and trust in them and let them grow more organically more naturally mm -hmm. um yeah yeah and i and didn't you say um i know that you spoke to andres which who is one of the yeah um one of my co-leaders in the training and you spoke at length about dissociation. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage everybody to go back to that podcast and listen to whatever the two of you talked about around dissociation. Because um, if you're going to do self-exploration with cannabis and, turn, and go inward, um, that you need to understand dissociation. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important so that you can create that map more effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, and under and not misunderstand what's happening because that's that's a big deal. We misunderstand a lot of what we're experiencing. Um, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I mean, I think part of the value of working with a therapist is they can help you to catch the disassociation and work with it and, and notice it. And it can be trickier to do on trickier to do on your own, obviously. And sometimes uh, impossible because impossible, dissociation yeah. is is like literally a blind spot. That's right. exactly right. what it is. And it yeah. tries to protect you from things that um, are scary. But often those things are only scary from the... I mean, they can be truly scary. I mean, like being raped as a child, that's mm. truly, um, uh, truly horrifying, even to an adult. But, but your dissociation is trying to protect you from those things, mm -hmm. and rightly so. But as an adult... Um, you can, uh, you can handle that. Yeah. I mean, but if you have that in your background, you need a therapist. You need to right, have a, somebody else helping you hold that space. Yeah. I think it can be helpful to differentiate like big T trauma, something like being raped or mm -hmm. physically assaulted or whatever it is versus like the little T traumas that all of us to some degree or another have. And so at least that's what I've been kind of taught and to be really careful about trying to open up or work with more severe traumas on your own, like the, well, what I, a I therapist that, is wearing. I think yeah. dissociation um, does speak to a big T trauma, mm -hmm. though we might call it a little T trauma at times. If, mm. if, if the trauma is, is that you've never bonded to your parents and therefore mm. you can't bond to your spouse and you can't bond to your, bond to your children, mm. um, that's a, that's a big T. That's a big one. Yeah. But you can, but um, you know, you can you can heal it and often you can heal it without the help of a therapist if you don't have a bunch of other what we would consider more big t traumas in childhood 
you know, those those require some extra holding and some yeah. more um, uh, sophisticated holding. Like you want to go to someone who knows what they're doing to hold that stuff because, you know, um, you want good help. Yeah. Good. Well, so, so yeah. So again, I mean, if someone's listening to this and wants to try this out and put into practice, like what kind of things would you recommend, like in terms of the practical steps? Um, try a low dose to start with. Um, and put on some gentle music. What you want to create is a safe space. Um, the safer it feels, the better, the cozier, the better. Um, you don't need to be provocative at all with yourself. You just create a safe container, put on music in the background. I recommend music that doesn't have any words because mm. you don't want to be influenced from the outside. Um, you know, just like in therapy, you would put on eye shades, lay down, and then just start observing and pay close attention to your body because mm. all of this is embodied on some level, even mm. some of the spiritual stuff or the psychic realm stuff is embodied. So let your body do the hard work. Mm. And, you know, if it feels like your mind is spinning out, come back to body, you know, and it may feel like, ooh, I'm getting dizzy. Just let it happen because what will happen is it'll... You'll get dizzy and then it'll, you know, it'll move through. So what you want to do is notice what comes up. Try to be, try to step into that witness hmm. place where you're just observing yourself. Try to observe without judgment. Um, you know, uh, we can often be very harsh on ourselves and... Um, think that because something feels bad that we're bad, try not to over identify with the feelings. That's a good point. And, um, and allow them, you know, like I said, and this is why I was kind of focusing on this, they're often the feelings of a child, mm. you know. Um, so if you feel scared, it's it's often a child part that's emerging to be integrated. That's beautiful, yeah. And and try to hold it that way. Try to hold it as a child. You can even get a sense of how old you were often if you allow for that. If you don't focus on it being true in the present moment, but true from the past, you can get a sense of what age you were at. Mm -hmm. And and then try to show up for the child, you know, just mm say, yeah, I'm an adult, I'm here, um, see if you can, like, have that conversation with yourself. We are constantly having conversations with ourselves, so it's not as weird as it sounds. <laughs> That's a good point, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our parts are always in conflict, and, you know, we have a lot of parts. Um, try to, to just be a steady, safe place for that child to come and feel their feelings, if they have to hide under the blankets, let them hide. You know, if they have yeah. to cry, let them cry. And um, and just try to be kind. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I love that. It just it made me think about, like, priming. Like, if you listen to this conversation and are kind of primed for it, and mm -hmm. then go into that experience with cannabis, or honestly, you could even do it without cannabis, right? Mm -hmm. then oh, these, yeah. these parts can come up, these feelings, the, you know, the everything you're talking about, and you can, it's almost like you've set forth an invitation, and then they're they're waiting, wanting to come out anyway. Mm -hmm. But what sometimes isn't happening is they're trying to come up, and you're not recognizing them as such, right? You're avoiding them, or you're like, I don't want to feel that, or you're like, mm -hmm. what's wrong with me? Instead mm -hmm. of the perspective you're offering of, like, how can I connect with this and hold it and help heal this, help show up for this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And even, you know, it's uncanny often how they emerge. Mm. Like, let, like I had this experience where um, I was doing a medicine. No, I, I was sleeping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was not doing a medicine session. I was sleeping. And I woke up like, like, and this is super unusual for me, but I like 
woke up straight up in bed and was like, <sighs> you know, like wow. just terrified. Um, and I had had this dream. And so um, afterwards, I was, anytime I wasn't doing something, anytime I would sit down, um, the, what was coming up in the dream would emerge. And it mm. felt like my arms were useless. I felt useless across my chest. My mm. arms were useless. And, um, and it, it wasn't happening when I was cleaning the house or going for a walk or something like that. It was only happening when I sat down and I had the space for it to emerge. Mm. So I, because I, you know, I have been doing this a long time. I know to go. Those two things probably tie together. Mm. So then I went and did a medicine session to see what would happen. Mm. And what I found was, ultimately, it, it was, I had like some fear and, mm. and a bunch of body reactions. And what will happen is, you know, you'll often have imagery that comes with it. Like I had this feeling of like, being a genie trapped in a bottle inside my body and I wanted to get out. That was oh, the wow. imagery, but the fear was, get me out of here, get me out of here. Mm. And then <clears throat> it went to um, this feeling in the back of my head and the imagery was a birdcage with uh, something hiding in the back of the birdcage all crawled up in the back and it was a sensation in the back of my head. Oh. When I went to that sensation, the memory emerged and it was myself when I was about five. I, used, I was terrified of the dark as a kid. And I would make a bed in my closet and sleep in the back of the closet, mm. like with my back into the corner. Mm. And that's what it was. It was that it led me to that memory. And so I was able to just be with myself in the closet, mm. you know, my adult self. And it was kind of like that kid part that was hiding in the back of the closet got my attention to show me how to get to her by allowing me to have that dream, which was so unusual, which brought in the physical symptoms of the dissociation, which is why the, the podcast on dissociation would be super helpful. Yeah. And then um, allowed me to feel the dissociation. So once I found her in, the, in, in that closet, all of a sudden... My arms, I felt that uselessness that I was feeling every time I sat down in my body. Mm. So I just felt it and felt it and felt it. I feel so useless when I was like, mm. and I just felt it until it resolved. And then I had mm. like released what that little part was holding. Mm. Beautiful. That's yeah. an example. Yeah. That's a good example though. And it took some time. It took some patience. And it, yeah. yeah. It took me, it took me about a week to put it all together and then give myself the space for the medicine session and get someone to hold the space mm. for me because I, you know, yeah. because I could tell from the fear that it, I needed someone to hold it for me. Yeah. And I like how you said, put it all together because often it can be helpful to have the quote unquote story, the memory, the what happened, where mm -hmm. it's coming from. It can be really helpful too, right? It helps the system relax. It helps her. If we want to use like the left brain, right brain kind of thing to, Helps the left brain, left brain understand what's going on, and like then it can relax around it and accept totally. it and make totally. sense of it. And, yeah, and even yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, and and think, oh, good, I'm going to get to let go of something, and, yeah. which means on the other side of it, I'm going to have more access to myself, more power, more um, more sense of goodness. Beautiful, yeah. And part of what you're describing is an organic process. You know, to use that phrase, innate healing. It's happening naturally. You don't have to hunt things down or manufacture them or, or yeah i couldn't make that to, happen yeah it's just a natural emergence right right i yeah. couldn't have gone into a therapy session and talked about it and made that happen mm. i had what 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 works is allowing it to happen mm. you know giving the space for it to happen and we get better and better at that yeah you know it makes me think about something i've seen in my own practice with therapy and i think in myself too it's like someone comes in and they're like i've got this thing i know i need to talk about it here it is uh, this therapy isn't working. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's a very top-down approach. I've been talking about this and, for 20 years. <laughs> yeah, I've been talking about this for 20 years, and it doesn't work. It doesn't help. It's still here. Mm -hmm. And so they get, have these bottom-up approaches where there's the natural emergence, what's actually emerging in your physical somatic experience is so important and so powerful. So, yeah. I know we've been talking a long time, but 
I, I kind of want to make a, I, when, I, when I was driving over here, I, I just kind of was watching the Matrix Resurrections. Have you seen that uh, yet? No, I haven't seen that. Oh, you haven't? Well, nah. I don't want to give any, I, I was going to do like cartoon? a spoiler alert. Um, no, it's the fourth Matrix. Have you watched oh, any of the I Matrixes? Oh, I did watch that one. Yeah, I've seen all the movies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay so you've seen the fourth movie. I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it was a good plot. It was a, I can't say I love the movie, but yeah. It wasn't a great movie, a great but it was an <laughs> awesome metaphor. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like how they start out with the, you know, you have a choice. You can take the blue pill or the red pill. And uh -huh. and if you take the blue pill, you'll stay in the dream and you'll wake up in your bed and you'll... You right. won't even remember this. Oh, yeah. It um, repeats the thing from the first movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you take the red pill, you're gonna we're gonna show you what reality is, and you know, and you're gonna you're gonna go down this rabbit hole. Yeah. And it's like, I and the the association I was making was like the the blue pill is a lot of what we do and a lot of what we take medicinally to suppress. Mm the um contact with ourselves mm, okay. you know yeah so like if i if i'm afraid and i'm taking something to you know like i'm drinking a couple beers to to make that that fear um go down then i'm taking the blue pill i'm like suppressing um contact with myself mm -hmm. which you, it's totally a legit thing to do from time to time but it's but it's so habitual and it's been so habituated in our culture that we actually have so little contact with ourselves it's terrifying to take the red pill <laughs> right yeah because yeah. you know in the matrix what happens is neo takes the red pill and um and he goes down the rabbit hole and reality is like this uh dysutopian nightmare <laughs> it's like, like the why, epitome why of a bad trip why would you want to go there yeah 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 and and it and it's like i don't know what that movie was for i don't know if it was like <laughs> help us see something or to scare the crap out of us because you know we think if we take the red pill we get this dysutopian nightmare and often if we take the red pill let's say cannabis what we have come up is anxiety and fear Mm. And we feel disconnected from mm. from ourselves and from other people. I mean, there's that sense of disreality mm. that often will come when you like, smoke cannabis. But what you're saying is that's a chance to actually work through that, which is actually there for you all the time anyway. You're just ignoring it. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like you're already in the red pill world. <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. Totally. We are the yeah. red pill. The The rabbit hole is us. Yeah. And, and the, um, you know... What we what happens is we associate that disconnection and that fear and anxiety with something bad about us, mm. when really it's just a feeling that has that we're holding that we need to release. Yeah, because we are not bad, and we have all we need to reconnect to each other. Ultimately, I'm not saying it's not going to be painful. Right. I'm just saying that we have that's the pain that. Is Ooh. necessary. Is yeah. There's a few interesting things you just said, but I think one thing is like negativity, violence, drama. That's way, 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 way more entertaining to watch on your movie screen or your TV or whatever than you know a scene of everyone just being happy and sitting around. So I think these movies, as powerful as they are, they t they definitely play on our negativity bias and our mm -hmm. penchant for you know watching things go to shit because that's like <laughs> exciting. Well, uh, so, <laughs> and. It also serves a purpose. It's not just that it's entertaining, but it's actually serving a purpose because when you suppress, you, uh, when you're suppressing these things that are so scary, mm -hmm. like our lack of connection and, you know, our uh, our fear of other people or, you know, all, uh, trauma, when you're suppressing it to try to survive in the world, mm. um, it's like you build kinetic energy. So, like, as... As you suppress it, if you can think about it, it's like you're suppressing, suppressing, you keep suppressing, and it's like you build up this pressure like that, like mm. a ball under the water, which I think we might have talked about in the, you know, you push a ball under the water, and the further down you push it, the mm. more pressure it builds, and then if it slips out, it's very explosive. Right. Um, but if you let it come up like that, it's not explosive. Right. Um, so... Yeah. The suppression, the habit we have of taking the, this is why I want to talk about the fourth matrix, because mm. it's what is so good about the metaphor is how, you know, it, 
spoiler alert, <laughs> if you haven't watched Matrix 4 Resurrections, pause this podcast right now, <laughs> go watch it, and then come back. <laughs> it's, no, it's just, it's, it's fantastic. And it, okay, so I'm going to say yeah, it. Yeah, do it. It opens with Neo being back in the Matrix, right? He oh, sacrifices yeah. himself to the Matrix, and he's back in the Matrix as one of the programmers of the Matrix. Uh, you know, he's a yeah. video game programmer. Yeah. And so, um, and he's under the care of a psychiatrist that is oh, prescribing no, yeah. him blue pills. My memory is coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. Right? And so as, like, memories are coming back to him and he's terrified that he's going to lose his mind again. He takes the blue pill. He goes back to the psychiatrist and is telling him about it. And the, the first thing the psychiatrist says to him is, <clears throat> have you taken your medication? Are you taking your medication, uh, Neo? I'm sure many listeners can relate to that conversation yeah. with their psychiatrist. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah. Well, it's and the like ending it, is beautiful. Yeah, I remember I actually really appreciated the plot of that movie, but the actual movie felt disappointing to me. But yeah, that's mm -hmm, it's a powerful, powerful story. And the metaphor, or not metaphor, with the psychiatrist is, is profound. Because like, <laughs> we're such an over-medicated society, and people are... I honestly have a conversation with someone probably once or twice a week, and they call me and they're like, you know, I always ask about previous experiences with therapists or psychiatrists, and often hear, yeah, I worked with the psychiatrist for however many years, and they charged me $300 an hour, and uh -huh. I don't want to do that anymore, and <laughs> it didn't really help. And so I'm not saying that that doesn't help ever, like psychiatric medication can for sure help, but I think, um, I, don't, I don't know if I agree if, with like the lifelong nature that many of us get, many people get sucked into taking these medications for years on end. And mm -hmm. Yeah, and we know just, there's yeah. there's a lot of research around, you know, if you suppress emotions, um, they'll move into physical manifestations yeah. and you'll yeah. get sick. And yeah. Gabriel Mate has a book out. Uh, it's an old one. It's, I think it might be one of the first that he published. It was um, When the Body Says No. And it's, mm. and it's just like these anecdotal stories of his caseload mm. of people who had suppressed emotion that manifested as physical illness. He was looking at it through the lens of a, of, oh. of a doctor, like an MD, but yeah. not a psychiatrist. But the, um, another, another interesting thing you said is connecting taking cannabis with taking the red pill. And for a lot of people, they might not think about it that way. And so you come back to the power of our own mind, of your own view, like obviously different people will be drawn to different medicine, or some people will be drawn to not taking any, you know, external medication and something like meditation, mindfulness, yoga, mm -hmm. different forms of therapy can, can be super helpful. So I don't, I'm not here to like promote one particular way, Yeah. but if you are going to explore something like cannabis, take a moment to check in and like see what your view of it is and see if you can see it in a positive way and see it as medicine and see it as helpful and do it in a way that actually feels helpful and good to you. And then you'll have a different result versus seen it as like a vice and I'm avoiding right. everything. I'm going to take it to avoid everything and I'm going to feel bad or self-critical. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's so interesting that the, the substance could be the same, but the relationship with it can be vastly different. Right? Right. The experiences with it can be vastly different. Vastly. And it's such, it's such a good friend. It'll allow you to set the intention and decide what you need. So do you need mm. to suppress something or do you want it to be expressed? Mm. I mean, that's how, I mean, cannabis is really quite a magical plant, and mm. um, and if you choose to suppress with cannabis, that is that's okay. Mm. That's a, it's it's like just know you're doing it. I mean, that's you, you start that's, to get conscious of that, understand mm -hmm. why, and and actually support yourself there as a step and a path to greater healing versus yeah. fighting against yourself or beating yourself up. Yeah, that's the key. I mean, that's ultimately the key to yeah. our healing as a as a species is to um, respect the intelligence that's going on under the uh, below the radar within yourself and mm. like. That's where true love comes in for self mm. is when you understand that you are always looking out for yourself. Everything you're doing is a brilliant uh, strategy for survival, and maybe it can be updated so that you can actually be happy. Nice. Yeah. Because we all deserve that. All of us. Yeah, we all deserve to be happy and to have that sense of bondedness and connection that you're talking about. I think that's part of our birthright. It's humans. our birthright. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really inspired about that. The more I learn about our nervous systems and how we're all connected and 
our social connection systems and all that. It's like restoring, it's almost like restoring our natural ecosystem mm -hmm. within human communities, within our own body, hopefully within the bigger world ecosystems too. Like it all goes together. But you can imagine like, I'm reading this uh, book, I think it's called The Heart of Trauma, and it has this beautiful metaphor of our nervous system like a tree and like actually imagining that, you know, like the roots down in our feet and the crown of the tree in our head and like the nervous system isn't just our brain, it's distributed throughout our whole body. But then these trees are in a forest. They exist in a forest with other trees and plants and animals and it's this whole ecosystem. And you can't take the tree out and put it in a little isolated, you know, glass bubble or something, it's going to die. So. Mm -hmm. to honor that, that deep connection that we have. And we yeah. can't actually put ourselves in the glass bubble, but what ends up happening is you've got all these trees in the forest that, that um, think the other trees are dangerous. Mm. Right. It's like... It's like it, all the it, fear. It's a lot like an immune system mm. in that um, we, could, we, our own, we have a, the sense of an autoimmune disorder is... The Im immune system identifying parts that are that are good and helpful and part of the self as an enemy, mm -hmm. and that's when you that's get sick. Fascinating, yeah, that's a good connection actually. And so, if we're seeing everyone else in the world is not safe, or the news does this to us in part, like it, it's pumping us full of fear all the time. That's that's kill a big your problem. TV. <laughs> 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 yeah, of course there are times where something bad will happen or where you might not be safe. But I think for most of us, almost all of us, like 99.99, whatever it is, percent of the time, you go to the grocery store and it's fine. <laughs> and so to actually like recognize that and acknowledge it, like, oh, I'm safe, I'm doing this thing, like have that appreciation, that gratitude, there's food here, there's safety here. It doesn't take, it's not like an act of imagination. It's like looking around your world and acknowledging the truth. And there mm -hmm. might be some moments where that's not true, but those moments are the exception. Mm -hmm. For most everyone in this country, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we're not in, thank God, you know, I feel for people in a war zone, Ukraine, Russia, mm -hmm. it's going to be different. Um, but even, you know, let's say you live to be 80 years old and four years of that, you went through this terrible war and that was horrible. Mm -hmm. That's four years out of 80, you know, like we can actually start to root in and appreciate the majority of our time is safe, is connected, is having mm -hmm. our needs met. And I think the missing piece for so many people that I work with, it's like, hard to recognize that, hard to feel that, hard to know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That disconnection makes you feel like you're, you don't even belong here. Yeah. And that's so painful. Yeah. Um, to think that we are uh, problematic in our own environment, you know, yeah. we don't belong in the universe <laughs> and, <laughs> and things like that. Uh. And it's like, uh, no, we are a manifestation of uh, the universe at a very high level. And, mm. Um, and we, we have a lot of magic and yeah, well, beautiful. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Mm -hmm. That was fun again. That's a great conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'll link uh, your website and everything in the show notes below so people can find you. Yeah. And you know, what would be fun. Yeah. I, I, do you mind if I throw something out? Yeah, like, I think you might enjoy this, but if anything that we said brings up questions about how do you sit with cannabis at home? Mm. Yeah. We could take those questions, bring them in, and um, answer them. Yeah. That would be fun. That would be a fun one. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of A State of Mind Podcast. I work here in Boulder, Colorado as a psychotherapist, coach, and meditation teacher, and you can learn more about that at estateofmindcounseling.org. You can learn more about the podcast at our website, estateofmindpodcast.com, and you can also get a t-shirt, stickers, a hoodie, like this one I'm wearing, Another goodie is send us a message if you want those. Feel free to send us any feedback. If you'd like to support this podcast directly, you can do that at patreon.com backslash the state of mind. And another way that you can support the show is just to share it with friends, share it with family, post about it on your social media accounts, leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. All those things make a big difference and they're greatly appreciated. And I really appreciate everyone who listens to this, who sends us a message, who shows their support. We are had over 100 episodes now and it's just been an incredible journey with this podcast and i'm really looking forward to bringing you more great episodes great conversations and great content in the future so stay tuned and i will see you here next time